I'm going to show you how to do the GCSE physics required practical measuring the speed of waves in a liquid and in a solid as well and we're going to be using a piece of string for that. So we're going to be starting off with measuring the speed of a water wave and we're going to be using a ripple tank for this. All this is is a pool of water on the top and we have an oscillator that's going up and down. The wave's going to be going across the ripple tank but the oscillator's going up and down so that means they're perpendicular, that means we have a transverse wave. The light is going to shine through here, through the water. We have a mirror here which is going to reflect it towards the camera. So you'll be able to see the waves on the screen at the front. Now your ripple tank might have a different design, but you're going to be using the same ideas for whatever ripple tank you have. Now just a note about where the oscillator goes. You can probably move it up and down. It's a good idea to have it just about touching the water. That way you get the most prominent waves so you can see them more clearly. So we're going to be turning off the lights and putting down the blinds now because we want to be able to see the waves on the screen as clearly as possible. So I'm going to turn the ripple tank on now and it's going to start oscillating. Problem is you can't really see the waves too well on the screen. This ripple tank however has a strobe light on it so if I turn that on The frequency that this light up here is flashing with matches the frequency of the oscillator so it looks like these waves are stationary. That makes it a lot easier to measure their wavelength. Now as you can see down here I have the oscillator set to 50 Hertz and obviously the strobe is flashing at 50 Hertz as well. So I have my frequency. If you are sensitive to flashing lights then you will not want to use the strobe. What you can do instead is with lower frequencies they're going slow enough that you can actually count how many waves are passing a point every second and you can get the frequency from that. 50 Hertz should be okay. It's usually frequencies of 20 Hertz or below when that can cause a problem. Now the wave equation is V equals F lambda or C equals F lambda. That is wave speed equals frequency times wavelength. So in order to find out the speed we not only need to know the frequency but also the wavelength too. Now you can if you want to just take the frequency and the wavelength, you can measure it on here, and then you can times them together to find the wave speed. But we're going to do it a little bit more scientifically by drawing a graph. So we're gonna take a number of results for different frequencies. One of the problems is, is that because the light is shining down through the water, then bouncing off the mirror onto this screen, the final image is actually magnified compared to the actual waves. So we first of all need to figure out how much bigger the image is on the screen than the waves themselves. So I'm just going to turn the oscillator off but keep the light on. I'm going to use my credit card here. I'm just going to pop that into my ripple tank. As you can see, the card looks a lot bigger on here than in reality. So I'm going to measure the image size of this first. Now you're going to measure a lot more accurately than me. That is bang on 18 centimeters. That's a nice round number. And then I'm going to measure what the actual size is. Now the actual size is 8.6 centimeters. So if you do 18 divided by 8.6, that gives us a magnification of 2.09. Let's round it up to 2.1. That means that whatever wavelength we measure on the screen, we're gonna to have to divide it by 2.1 to get the real wavelength. So let's put the oscillator back on and start measuring some wavelengths. I'm gonna start at 50 Hertz and then we'll work backwards. So to get the most accurate and reliable results, it's a good idea not to just measure one wavelength. That's the distance between a peak and the next peak. I'm gonna measure 10. So using the very well-defined waves here, closer to this end, uh, I'm going to say that each dark line is a peak of a wave. So lined up the zero of my ruler on one wave. So I'm gonna count then 10 from there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 and I can see that that comes to a distance of 11.7 centimeters. Remember that when you do line up your ruler, your zero has to be lined up to your zeroth wave. So you're not counting from one, you're counting from zero, then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So 11.7 centimeters, divide that by 10, and we end up with a wavelength of 1.17 centimeters. Then we want to change the frequency. We're going to go down to 40 hertz and see how that affects the wavelength. Now we can take our wavelength and sort out the magnification afterwards. Let's just get our readings off the screen first. So down to 40 hertz, let's measure 10 again. So starting at zero and zero, counting from there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
So I can see that that is 13.8. So 13.8 with 10 wavelengths, so that means that one wavelength is 1.38 centimeters. Again, we're gonna have to divide that by 2.1 later. So now we're at 30 hertz, I'm gonna measure them once more. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. That is 17.1. So 10 wavelengths is 17.1. So that means that one wavelength is 1.71. We'll divide those in a second. So as you can see, as you decrease the frequency, the wavelength gets longer. And you probably know that that's gonna be the case. If the waves are being produced less quickly, then there's gonna be a bigger distance between each wave. So when you do this experiment, you can then go down to 20 hertz and 10 hertz, and you can get those results. These are my results for 20 and 10 hertz as well. And I've divided by 2.1 to get the actual wavelength as well. You might have different frequencies, but it's a good idea to have a good range of frequencies, at least five readings. There are two things that you can do with this data then. You can just find the speed for each of your readings. So frequency times wavelength, F times lambda, and then just see how similar your results are, or you could get a mean speed. Or if you wanna be a little bit more scientific, you can draw a graph of your results. Now, because the relationship is V equals F times lambda, we can't have a graph of frequency against wavelength and have a straight line because as we've seen as one goes up the other one goes down that's what we call an inversely proportional relationship so to fix that what we need to do is one divided by the wavelength or do the reciprocal we call it of each wavelength and then on your graph you can have frequency and one divided by wavelength and then you can draw a lovely straight line of best fit that hopefully goes through the origin the gradient of the graph will give you the speed of the wave in meters per second. So that's how you can measure the speed of a wave on water by changing the frequency and measuring the wavelength. You can also measure the speed of waves on string as well. So I'm gonna set that up and I'll show you what to do with that next. All right, so to measure the speed of a wave on a piece of string, this is the setup I have here. I have a signal generator, so that's just producing an electrical current. That's going to my vibration generator here. It's basically a speaker with a bit poking out goes up and down. I have my piece of string connected to there, going all the way to the end of the table, and that's connected to just a 100 gram mass on the end. You don't want to put much more mass on there, otherwise it could break the vibration generator. So what's going on with this piece of string is that the oscillator is going up and down, and it's causing a wave which is going along the string. However, when the wave gets to the end here, it actually bounces back. And what we have is one wave traveling to the left, one wave traveling to the right, and they end up what we call interfering. They actually create what we call a stationary wave, also known as a standing wave. And we can actually measure the wavelength of these standing waves when they're made to find out what the speed of the wave on the string is. So it's only at specific frequencies that we get these standing waves made. So let's see if we can get the simplest standing wave that we can. There we go. Can you see that we've actually just got one loop? These two bits on the end here that basically aren't moving, okay, this one's moving a tiny bit, but not really compared to the middle, we call those nodes. This in the middle, where it's moving a lot, we call that an anti-node. You don't actually need to know all about the whole standing wave business for your GCSE, but it's useful to know where this wave comes from. But just because it's a standing wave, it doesn't make a difference, we can still measure the wavelength just as normal. However, how many waves do we have being made on this piece of string here? Well, if we think about when the wave is at the maximum at the top here, the string is going up and coming back down. It's not going up, down, and back to where it started. So that means we actually only have half a wavelength between the two ends. So I'm going to measure this half a wavelength. So I'm gonna measure it from there to there. Oh, look at that, it happens to be exactly one meter, what are the chances? So if one meter is half a wavelength, that means that one complete wavelength is two meters. What frequency was that for? Well, looking at my dial here, I can see that it's at 1.4, but we have the times 10 there, so that means that it's 1.4 times 10, that's 14 hertz. So this frequency on the string is 14 hertz, and the wavelength is two meters. 
So what you can do then is change the frequency until you get the next standing wave or stationary wave. So if I increase it, I'm looking for not one loop, but two loops. There we go. Can you see that we have one loop here and a second loop there? So now we have from here to here, between both ends of the string, we don't have half a wave, but we have a whole wave. Now you have two options here. Either you can measure from node to node and measure half the wavelength and double it, or you can just measure the whole length of the string, and you know what that is already, it's one meter, and say that we have two loops, or rather one whole wavelength. So the wavelength this time round is just one meter, whereas before it was two meters. So you can probably see where this relationship is going. Let's have a look at the frequency. That is 30 hertz. Let's keep going. Let's see if we can get three loops on our piece of string now. There we go. We have half a wavelength, half a wavelength, half a wavelength. From here to here, we've actually got one and a half wavelengths. So again, you can either measure from node to node here, or you can measure just the whole length of the string, just divide by three. So if I take one meter, and I know that two thirds of that is going to be my wavelength, then it's going to be 66.666 centimeters. We can round that up to 67 centimeters. And that frequency was 46 hertz. Let's see if we can get four. There we go, we now have four loops. So again, one meter, four loops, so that's two whole wavelengths, so that means our wavelength is 50 centimeters. The frequency is 63 hertz. Let's see if we can go one more to get five. They get harder and harder to see the higher the frequency you go, so five is probably gonna be the limit that you hit. So there's my five loops. So again, if I have five loops on here, then that means that I have two and a half whole wavelengths. So one meter with two and a half wavelengths on, that means that my wavelength is 40 centimeters. And that frequency is 88 hertz. Just like with the ripple tank, what I can do now is take my frequency and put it on the y-axis of a graph, and then I can calculate the reciprocal of the wavelength. So that's one divided by the wavelength, or one over lambda, and that can go on my x-axis. That should give me a nice straight line graph, and the gradient of that is going to give me the wave speed. If you're not keen on doing that, like I said, what you can do is just take the frequency and the wavelength for each reading, times those together, and you can take the average to get the average speed of the wave on the piece of string.